Chapter Sixteen of The Sleeper Awakes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. B. The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells. Chapter Sixteen the monoplane the flying stages of london were collected together in an irregular crescent on the southern side of the river they formed three groups of two each and retained the names of ancient suburban hills or villages they were named in order roehampton wimbledon park streatham norwood blackheath and shooter's hill they were uniform structures rising high above the general roof surfaces. Each was about four thousand yards long and a thousand broad, and constructed of the compound of aluminum and iron that had replaced iron in architecture. Their higher tiers formed an open work of girders through which lifts and staircases ascended. The upper surface was a uniform expanse with portions, the starting carriers that could be raised and were then able to run on very slightly inclined rails to the end of the fabric graham went to the flying stages by the public ways he was accompanied by asano his japanese attendant lincoln was called away by ostrog who was busy with his administrative concerns a strong guard of wind vane police awaited the master outside the wind vane offices and they cleared a space for him on the upper moving platform. His passage to the flying stages was unexpected. Nevertheless, a considerable crowd gathered and followed him to his destination. As he went along, he could hear the people shouting his name and saw numberless men and women and children in blue come swarming up the staircases in the central path, gesticulating and shouting. He could not hear what they shouted. He was struck again by the evident existence of a vulgar dialect among the poor of the city. When at last he descended, his guards were immediately surrounded by a dense, excited crowd. Afterwards it occurred to him that some had attempted to reach him with petitions. His guards cleared a passage for him with difficulty. He found a monoplane in charge of an aeronaut awaiting him on the westward stage. Seen close, this mechanism was no longer small. As it lay on its launching carrier upon the wide expanse of the flying stage, its aluminum body skeleton was as big as the hull of a twenty-ton yacht. Its lateral supporting sails braced and stayed with metal nerves almost like the nerves of a bee's wing, and made of some sort of glassy artificial membrane, cast their shadow over many hundreds of square yards. The chairs for the engineer and his passenger hung free to swing by a complex tackle, within the protecting ribs of the frame and well abaft the middle the passenger's chair was protected by a wind guard and guarded about with metallic rods carrying air cushions it could if desired be completely closed in but graham was anxious for novel experiences and desired that it should be left open the aeronaut sat behind a glass that sheltered his face the passenger could secure himself firmly in his seat, and this was almost unavoidable on landing, or he could move along by means of a little rail and rod to a locker at the stem of the machine, where his personal luggage, his wraps and restoratives were placed, and which also, with the seats, served as a make-weight to the parts of the central engine that projected to the propeller at the stern. The flying stage about him was empty, save for Asano and their suite of attendants. Directed by the aeronaut, he placed himself in his seat. Asano stepped through the bars of the hull, and stood below on the stage, waving his hand. He seemed to slide along the stage to the right and vanish. The engine was humming loudly, the propeller spinning, and for a second the stage and the buildings beyond were gliding swiftly and horizontally past Graham's eye. Then these things seemed to tilt up abruptly. He gripped the little rods on either side of him instinctively. He felt himself moving upward, heard the air whistle over the top of the windscreen. The propeller screw moved with powerful rhythmic impulses. 
One, two, three, pause. One, two, three, which the engineer controlled very delicately. The machine began a quivering vibration that continued throughout the flight, and the roof areas seemed running away to starboard very quickly and growing rapidly smaller. He looked from the face of the engineer through the ribs of the machine. Looking sideways, there was nothing very startling in what he saw. A rapid funicular railway might have given the same sensations. He recognized the council house and the Highgate Ridge, and then he looked straight down between his feet. For a moment physical terror possessed him, a passionate sense of insecurity. He held tight. For a second or so he could not lift his eyes. Some hundred feet or more sheer below him was one of the big wind vanes of southwest London, and beyond it the southernmost flying stage crowded with little black dots. These things seemed to be falling away from him. For a second he had an impulse to pursue the earth. He set his teeth, he lifted his eyes by a muscular effort, and the moment of panic passed. He remained for a space with his teeth set hard, his eyes staring into the sky. Throb, 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 beat, went the engine. Throb, 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 beat. He grabbed his bars tightly, glanced at the aeronaut, and saw a smile upon his suntanned face. He smiled in return, perhaps a little artificially. A little strange at first, he shouted before he recalled his dignity. But he dared not look down again for some time. He stared over the aeronaut's head to where a rim of vague blue horizon crept up the sky. For a little while he could not banish the thought of possible accidents from his mind. Throb, 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 beat. Suppose some trivial screw went wrong in that supporting engine. Suppose he made a grim effort to dismiss all such suppositions. After a while they did at least abandon the foreground of his thoughts. And up he went steadily, higher and higher into the clear air. Once the mental shock of moving unsupported through the air was over, his sensations ceased to be unpleasant, became very speedily pleasurable. He had been warned of air sickness but he found the pulsating movement of the monoplane as it drove up the faint southwest breeze was very little in excess of the pitching of a boat head-on to broad rollers in a moderate gale, and he was constitutionally a good sailor. And the keenness of the more rarefied air into which they ascended produced a sense of lightness and exhilaration. He looked up and saw the blue sky above fretted with cirrus clouds. His eye came cautiously down through the ribs and bars to a shining flight of white birds that hung in the lower sky. For a space he watched these. Then, going lower and less apprehensively, he saw the slender figure of the wind vane keeper's crow's nest shining golden in the sunlight and growing smaller every moment. As his eye fell with more confidence now, there came a blue line of hills and then London, already to leeward, an intricate space of roofing. Its near edge came sharp and clear, and banished his last apprehensions in a shock of surprise. For the boundary of London was like a wall, like a cliff, a steep fall of three or four hundred feet, a frontage broken only by terraces here and there, a complex decorative façade. The gradual passage of town into country through an extensive sponge of suburbs, which was so characteristic a feature of the great cities of the nineteenth century, existed no longer. Nothing remained of it here but a waste of ruins, variegated and dense with thickets of the heterogeneous growths that had once adorned the gardens of the belt, interspersed along leveled brown patches of sown ground and verdant stretches of winter greens the latter even spread among the vestiges of houses. But for the most part the reefs and scaries of ruins, the wreckage of suburban villas, stood among their streets and roads, queer islands amidst the leveled expanses of green and brown, 
abandoned indeed by the inhabitants years since, but too substantial, it seemed, to be cleared out of the way of the wholesale horticultural mechanisms of the time. The vegetation of this waste undulated and frothed amidst the countless cells of crumbling house walls, and broke along the foot of the city wall in a surf of bramble and holly and ivy and teasel and tall grasses. Here and there gaudy pleasure palaces towered amidst the puny remains of Victorian times, and cableways slanted to them from the city. That winter day they seemed deserted. Deserted, too, were the artificial gardens among the ruins. The city limits were indeed as sharply defined as in the ancient days when the gates were shut at nightfall, and the robber foemen prowled through the very walls. A huge semicircular throat poured out a vigorous traffic upon the Edomite Bath Road. So the first prospect of the world beyond the city flashed on Graham, and dwindled. And when at last he could look vertically downward again, he saw below him the vegetable fields of the Thames Valley, innumerable minute oblongs of ruddy brown, intersected by shining threads, the sewage ditches. His exhilaration increased rapidly, became a sort of intoxication. He found himself drawing deep breaths of air, laughing aloud, desiring to shout. After a time that desire became too strong for him, and he shouted. They curved about towards the south. They drove with a slight list to leeward, and with a slow alteration of movement, first a short, sharp ascent, and then a long downward glide that was very swift and pleasing. During these downward glides, the propeller was inactive altogether. These ascents gave Graham a glorious sense of successful effort. The descents through the rarefied air were beyond all experience. He wanted never to leave the upper air again. For a time he was intent upon the landscape that ran swiftly northward beneath him. Its minute, clear detail pleased him exceedingly. He was impressed by the ruin of the houses that had once dotted the country, by the vast treeless expanse of country from which all farms and villages had gone, save for crumbling ruins. He had known the thing was so, but seeing it so was an altogether different matter. He tried to make out familiar places within the hollow basin of the world below, but at first he could distinguish no data now that the Thames Valley was left behind. Soon, however, they were driving over a sharp chalk hill that he recognized as Guildford Hog's Back, because of the familiar outline of the gorge at its eastward end, and because of the ruins of the town that rose steeply on either lip of this gorge. And from that he made out other points, Leith Hill, the sandy wastes of Aldershot, and so forth. Save where the broad Edomite Portsmouth Road, thickly dotted with rushing shapes, followed the course of the old railway, the gorge of the way was choked with thickets. The whole expanse of the Downs Escarpment, so far as the grey haze permitted him to see, was set with wind-wheels, to which the largest of the city was but a younger brother. They stirred with a stately motion before the southwest wind, and here and there were patches dotted with the sheep of the British Food Trust, and here and there a mounted shepherd made a spot of black. Then, rushing under the stern of the plain, came the Wealden Heights, the line of Hindhead, Pitch Hill, and Leith Hill, with a second row of wind-wheels that seemed striving to rob the downland whirlers of their share of breeze. The purple heather was speckled with yellow gorse, and on the further side a drove of black oxen stampeded before a couple of mounted men. Swiftly these swept behind, and dwindled and lost color, and became scarce moving specks that were swallowed up in haze. And when these had vanished in the distance, Graham heard a pewit wailing close at hand. He perceived he was now above the South Downs, and staring over his shoulder he saw the battlements of Portsmouth Landing Stage towering over the ridge of Portsdown Hill. In another moment there came into sight a spread of shipping like floating cities, the little white cliffs of the needles dwarfed and sunlit, 
and the grey and glittering waters of the narrow sea. They seemed to leap the Solent in a moment, and in a few seconds the Isle of Wight was running past, and then beneath him spread a wider and wider extent of sea, here purple with the shadow of a cloud, here grey, here a burnished mirror, and here a spread of cloudy greenish blue. The Isle of Wight grew smaller and smaller. In a few more minutes a strip of grey haze detached itself from other strips that were clouds, descended out of the sky and became a coastline, sunlit and pleasant, the coast of northern France. It rose, it took colour, became definite and detailed, and the counterpart of the downland of England was speeding by below. In a little time, as it seemed, Paris came above the horizon, and hung there for a space, and sank out of sight again as the monoplane circled about to the north. But he perceived the Eiffel Tower still standing, and beside it a huge dome surmounted by a pinpoint colossus. And he perceived, too, though he did not understand it at the time, a slanting drift of smoke. The aeronaut said something about trouble in the underways that Graham did not heed, but he marked the minarets and towers and slender masses that streamed skyward above the city wind vanes, and knew that in the matter of grace at least, Paris still kept in front of her larger rival. And even as he looked, a pale blue shape ascended very swiftly from the city, like a dead leaf driving up before a gale. It curved round and soared towards them, growing rapidly larger and larger. The aeronaut was saying something. What? said Graham, loath to take his eyes from this. London aeroplane, sire, bawled the aeronaut, pointing. They rose and curved about northward as it drew nearer. Nearer it came, and nearer, larger and larger. The throb, 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 beat of the monoplane's flight that had seemed so potent and so swift suddenly appeared slow by comparison with this tremendous rush. How great the monster seemed! How swift and steady! It passed quite closely beneath them, driving along silently, a vast spread of wire-netted translucent wings, a thing alive. Graham had a momentary glimpse of the rows and rows of wrapped-up passengers, slung in their little cradles behind wind-screens, of a white-clothed engineer crawling against the gale along a ladder-way, of spouting engines beating together, of the whirling wind-screw, and of a wide waste of wing. He exulted in the sight, and in an instant the thing had passed. It rose slightly, and their own little wings swayed in the rush of its flight. It fell and grew smaller. Scarcely had they moved, as it seemed, before it was again only a flat blue thing that dwindled in the sky. This was the aeroplane that went to and fro between London and Paris. In fair weather and in peaceful times, it came and went four times a day. They beat across the channel, slowly as it seemed now to Graham's enlarged ideas, and Beachy Head rose greyly to the left of them. Land, called the aeronaut, his voice small against the whistling of the air over the wind-screen. Not yet, bawled Graham, laughing. Not land yet. I want to learn more of this machine. I meant, said the aeronaut, I want to learn more of this machine, repeated Graham. I'm coming to you, he said, and had flung himself free of his chair and taken a step along the guarded rail between them. He stopped for a moment and his color changed, and his hands tightened. Another step, and he was clinging close to the aeronaut. He felt a weight on his shoulder, the pressure of the air. His hat was a whirling speck behind. The wind came in gusts over his windscreen, and blew his hair in streamers past his cheek. The aeronaut made some hasty adjustments for the shifting of the centers of gravity and pressure. "'I want to have these things explained,' said Graham. What do you do when you move that engine forward? The aeronaut hesitated. Then he answered, They are complex, sire. 
I don't mind, shouted Graham. I don't mind. There was a moment's pause. Aeronautics is the secret, the privilege. I know, but I'm the master, and I mean to know. He laughed, full of this novel realization of power that was his gift from the upper air. The monoplane curved about, and the keen, fresh wind cut across Graham's face and his garment lugged at his body as the stem pointed round to the west. The two men looked into each other's eyes. "'Sire, there are rules.' "'Not where I am concerned,' said Graham. "'You seem to forget.' The aeronaut scrutinized his face. "'No,' he said. "'I do not forget, sire. "'But in all the earth, no man who is a sworn aeronaut "'has ever a chance. "'They come as passengers.' I have heard something of the sort, but I'm not going to argue these points. Do you know why I have slept two hundred years? To fly! Sire, said the aeronaut, the rules, if I break the rules... Graham waved the penalties aside. Then, if you will watch me... No, said Graham, swaying and gripping tight as the machine lifted its nose again for an ascent. That's not my game. I want to do it myself. Do it myself if I smash for it. No, I will. See, I'm going to clamber by this, to come and share your seat. Steady. I mean to fly of my own accord if I smash at the end of it. I will have something to pay for my sleep. Of all other things, in my past it was my dream to fly. Now, keep your balance. A dozen spies are watching me, sire. Graham's temper was at an end. Perhaps he chose it should be. He swore. He swung himself round the intervening mass of levers and the monoplane swayed. Am I master of the earth, he said, or is it your society? Now, take your hands off those levers and hold my wrists. Yes, so. And now, how do we turn her nose down to the glide? Sire, said the aeronaut, what is it? You will protect me. Lord, yes, if I have to burn London. Now, and with that promise, Graham bought his first lesson in aerial navigation. It's clearly to your advantage, this journey, he said with a loud laugh, for the air was like strong wine, to teach me quickly and well. Do I pull this? Ah, so, hello. Back, sire, back back right one two three good god ah up she goes but this is living and now the machine began to dance the strangest figures in the air now it would sweep round a spiral of scarcely a hundred yards diameter now rush up into the air and swoop down again steeply swiftly falling like a hawk to recover in a rushing loop that swept it high again in one of these descents it seemed driving straight at the drifting park of balloons in the southeast, and only curved about and cleared them by a sudden recovery of dexterity. The extraordinary swiftness and the smoothness of the motion, the extraordinary effect of the rarefied air upon his constitution, threw Graham into a careless fury. But at last a queer incident came to sober him, to send him flying down once more to the crowded life below, with all its dark, insoluble riddles. As he swooped came a tap and something flying past, and a drop like a drop of rain. Then, as he went down, he saw something like a white rag whirling down in his wake. "'What was that?' he asked. "'I did not see.' The aeronaut glanced, and then clutched at the lever to recover, for they were sweeping down. When the monoplane was rising again, he drew a deep breath and replied, That, and he indicated the white thing still fluttering down, was a swan. I never saw it, said Graham. The aeronaut made no answer, and Graham saw little drops upon his forehead. They drove horizontally while Graham clambered back to the passenger's place, out of the lash of the wind. And then came a swift rush down, with the wind screw whirling to check their fall, and the flying stage growing broad and dark before them. The sun, 
sinking over the chalk hills in the west, flew with them, and left the sky a blaze of gold. Soon men could be seen as little specks. He heard a noise coming up to meet him, a noise like the sound of waves upon a pebbly beach, and saw that the roofs of the flying stage were dense with his people rejoicing over his safe return. A black mass was crushed together under the stage, a darkness stippled with innumerable faces, and quivering with the minute oscillation of waved white handkerchiefs and waving hands. End of chapter 16